Did life start at the bottom of the oceans or did it start on land? Did it start in space and get delivered to Earth? So now we can make life on the lab, right? Uh, what is the mind? What, what is consciousness? There's two answers in the literature. One of them says it's a property of the central nervous system, in which case it's effectively an, an illusion. Can I clone myself now? Um, Who are you? <laughs> uh, I am Nick Lane. Uh, I am Professor of Evolutionary Biochemistry at University College London. Uh, and I work on the origin of life and early evolution. What 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 is your work in the university again? Biochemistry. What what is that? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it's a, let's say it's a made up job title. It's um, there there isn't really quite such a thing. Uh, there is a title, evolutionary biology. So you know the history of life on the planet, how it evolved, all of those kind of things. Um, Biochemistry is about the chemistry of life and, and, and how cells are working at the level of the chemistry underneath it. And it's actually, it's, it's, uh, it tells us a lot about how life evolved as well. And so most people who work on biochemistry work on diseases and, and medicine and things like that. So I call myself and a few others now do as well evolutionary biochemists because what I'm interested in really is how did life evolve on the planet but at the level of the chemistry that underpins everything. What do you mean at that, the level of chemistry that underpins everything? So the way that we work, we are, you could say, a continuous chemical reaction. We're a kind of a reaction between oxygen that we breathe in and the food that we're eating, and that's what keeps us alive. And it releases energy, and the energy powers the chemistry. And that chemistry is a kind of a, a network of reactions and hundreds of them. Actually, if, I mean, if you were to count them up in one cell, there would be maybe one billion reactions every second. So <laughs> uh, you have 50 trillion cells in you. So it's an incomprehensible number of reactions. And that's what is keeping you alive. And those reactions, the weird thing is, it's basically the same set of reactions with almost the same structure to them, the same kind of map structure that you see in a plant cell, in a tree, or you see it in a bacterial cell, or you see it in things living down in deep sea hydrothermal vents. It's more conserved than, in, even than the genes that are supposed to encode all of life. Well, this chemistry goes back before those genes. It's a kind of a, a map of how life works, uh, and it's uh, it's the most ancient thing about life so what is the difference between me and a rock uh you and a rock there's quite a big difference between uh you and a bacterial cell is just size really i mean a bacterial cell does the same kind of stuff that you do the same chemistry same speeds of reaction same kinds of reactions a rock is it just sits there and doesn't do anything so a rock doesn't have anything, uh, any bio, it is not, uh, doesn't have any, the one that you said, it, it has uh, it one billion times per second, doesn't that do anything of these things? No, it just kind of erodes and breaks down. And yes, it, it will react very, very slowly with oxygen in the air, but it doesn't really do anything. Now, funnily enough, there are some things that look a lot like rocks that are actually living. Um, stromatolites, for example, they, they look like kind of mushrooms of rock sitting in shallow water. And actually, they're made by bacteria, the kind of giant bacterial colonies that, that um, convert the minerals in the water around them into the rocks underneath them. And eventually, they bury themselves and they become a rock. And we can see fossils of these things going back three and a half billion years. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we know how far life goes back on the planet is, uh, is these rocks that we know from modern ones that you can see in places like Shark Bay in Australia that these are actually living rocks. Um, and, and, uh, and, and you see fossils of the same things from three and a half billion years ago. So first of all, I want to establish that I'm going to ask a lot of stupid questions, so excuse me in advance. <laughs> so long as you don't mind getting a lot of stupid answers. <laughs> so, uh, so, but, so at the planet at one point, it was basically only rocks as I, or... Or no rocks and water, uh, rocks and water, rocks and water, and how from rocks and water it became to this beautiful thing that we know. How long have you got? 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, we're talking, well, actually, we don't know how long we're talking. No, nobody's really agreed. The first signs of life on Earth, and people squabble about it, we're talking four billion years ago or thereabouts. Um, so it's pretty quick. Uh, there was a bombardment early on of meteorites and things hitting the Earth all the time. It didn't necessarily make it uninhabitable, but it certainly made made it look less good. Um, you know, one of the one of these big things that hit it early on uh, produced the moon. It kind of split the Earth into two chunks and, and 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 blew off the moon. That kind of thing would have sterilized anything that was on the planet at the time. Uh, but wow. that was four and a half. That was that, that was four and a half billion years ago, I, more or less. I didn't know that uh, the moon was part of Earth. Wow. <laughs> well, it was hit by a planet about the size of Mars, uh, and it kind of just smashed the Earth into two lumps. They, this is what the astronomers say, anyway. The the, the cosmologists. Um, anyway, so how how do you go? So we got a we got a planet. It's it's made of rocks and water. It's actually it's mostly ocean. Uh, there would have been some land. But maybe a complete landmass the size of Australia, probably not more than that at that that, that kind of time. Um, and the rest of it, uh, oceans, hard to know how deep they were. It sounds silly. You'd have thought they'd be more shallow if there was less land, but but also there was probably more water. Because um, there's a the, the the process that I think gives rise to life on Earth is a reaction between rock and water. It's kind of as simple as that. And now, which rock? The rock that makes up most of the mantle. So most of the mantle on, on Earth is made of a mineral called olivine. Uh, and it's got a lot of iron in it and magnesium. Uh, and, and the iron especially will react with water. It effectively just rusts. Um, and when, it, when it's rusting, when it's reacting with water, it, 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 um, it gives off bubbles of hydrogen gas in kind of alkaline fluids. Uh, and and the, the process is, is called serpentinization which is one of these scary scientific terms. And what it actually means is this mineral olivine, it's called olivine because it looks like olives, it's kind of green color. Um, and it reacts with water and it becomes metamorphosed, which is they transformed into a different kind of rock. It's basically rusted. Uh, and now it looks like the scales of a serpent. It's all kind of crinkly and, and, and still greenish. Um, so, so it's called serpentine or serpentinite. Uh, and the process is called serpentinization, at which point most normal people will start backing away and say, hang on, you, you're going too deep here. But uh, it, it, it's just a, ro- a reaction between rock and water that gives off hydrogen gas. Now, most planets have got a lot of CO2, carbon dioxide. We've got a problem with too much carbon dioxide now. But if you go back four billion years, maybe there was maybe a thousand times, maybe 10,000 times as much CO2. Um, there was a hell of a lot of CO2. There could have been one bar, maybe even 10 bars of CO2. Again, it's kind of really difficult to work this stuff out, and it's somewhat hypothetical. But a lot of CO2. Uh, and, and, and what you get if you have a reaction between hydrogen gas bubbling out of the ground in, in these, these hydrothermal systems and CO2 dissolved in the oceans, making the oceans quite acidic, uh, is, is basically organic molecules. That's what you get. That's what life does today. It's a reaction between hydrogen and CO2 to make all the organic molecules that make us up. Uh, and you, you know, you'll you'll know about photosynthesis, and you say, but "Hang on a minute, where's all the hydrogen coming from?" And the answer there is, well, it's using the power of sunlight to break up water into its component parts. And the component parts is H2O is water, so there's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. And you grab the two, you use the sun to break up the molecule, grab the two hydrogen atoms, stick it onto carbon dioxide to make an organic molecule, which is basically a molecule with carbon and hydrogen on it. And the oxygen, who cares? You just throw that away and it collects in the atmosphere and later on completely transformed the planet and made animals possible. But it's basically oxygen's a waste product uh, of, of plants and algae and things needing the hydrogen. So w- we need sun light like uh we need uh water and we need uh uh co2 to to make uh and uh, these are the basic elements that we really need uh, to create life kind of you don't even need sunlight um what you need is hydrogen and co2 and enough energy to make them react together and that energy now can come from sunlight, but in 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 
it can also come uh, from ele- forms of electricity and some hydrothermal vents. Effectively, they've got electrical wall. They've got electrified walls, and that electrified walls of the of these hydrothermal vents can drive that reaction uh, and make organic molecules inside hydrothermal vents. So that's where I think life starts. But nobody agrees uh, about about that. What What do you mean, nobody agrees? The field that works on the origin of life is, uh, is uh, let's call it grumpy. Um, people don't agree. Do, you know, did, did life start at the bottom of the oceans or did it start on land? Did it start in a volcano or did it start in Darwin's warm pond? Did it start? Did it start in space and get delivered to Earth? These are all, you know, the serious people uh, will believe those those stories. Uh, you know, there may be truth to all of them, but probably they can't all be right. Probably it has to be one or the other. You can't really start life at the bottom of the oceans and on land. Um, maybe you could say a few things from here and a few things from there, and they come together, but, you know, it's all a bit hand-wavy. So, so, yes, so, because, so, be, because it's so unlikely, unlikely to create life, so it's unlikely to be created from coming from a different planet or like do, uh, being from a... a Uh, land also in the ocean so it's very unlikely phenomenon to happen it cannot happen simultaneously Uh, no it's no it's not that i mean i think it's quite likely actually that life will start on a wet rocky planet um i think what you need is a continuous reaction remember when i said at the at the beginning we are a continuous chemical reaction we're burning food in oxygen all the time and that powers everything that we're doing you need the same thing for life even at the very beginning of life, you need a continuous reaction between hydrogen bubbling out of the ground and and CO2 dissolved in the oceans. There needs to be some structure, and a hydrothermal vent provides some of that structure. It provides the the, the electrical charges that make that reaction happen. And because the hydrothermal vent is continuous flow, you're continuously pumping stuff out of the ground into the into the oceans. You've got a continuous reaction. You could think of a of a of a vent like our lungs. Or, or the cardiovascular system where we're pumping blood around the body and we're delivering oxygen, we're delivering food to all of the cells in the body all the time. And if you put a plastic bag on your head, you're going to be dead within a minute or two. And same for life generally. If you don't have this continuous chemical reaction, you're dead. Uh, and, and so you need an environment where that reaction is just not ever going to stop. And, and so that's why I personally like hydrothermal vents because that reaction just goes on and on and on and it goes on for millions of years. Uh, and if you put it in a pond on land, well, the pond will dry up. <laughs> you know, there's, there's all kinds of problems with continuous reactivity. But there are also some clever answers to those things and there's some clever people and they, you know, uh, that's the nature of science. We all disagree with each other. <laughs> can you can you explain me a bit more what you believe uh, like uh, a bit more simply for me to understand? Uh, okay, um, so I've said we've got the rocks in the in the mantle reacting with water. So water, don't think of the water up here in the ocean. The water will will, will, will percolate down into the into the rock underneath the ocean, down little cracks. Yes. And things. Okay. And it can go a long way down, like five kilometers down. Um, uh, and reacts with the rocks down there that that cracks them and expands them and allows more water down so it's a kind of it's a it's a positive feedback that you get more and more water more, reacting with more and more rock that gives off these these fluids which are it's, it's warm uh, they are buoyant they kind of bubble back up to the bottom of the ocean and when they get there they react with the waters in the ocean and they precipitate out into a what's called a hydrothermal vent. I and mean, you've probably seen videos of hydrothermal vents. They're amazing things with very often black smoke coming billowing out of the top. They're very, very dynamic. Sometimes they, they're, they're, they're simpler and, and, and they're not, they don't look so dynamic. Sometimes it's just it, you don't see any smoke coming out, but, you, but they're still active. And so if you go inside that, if you go inside the hydrothermal vent, what you will see is like a labyrinth of interconnected pores. So if you were, if you shrank yourself down to the size of a, a, a molecule, it would be, you know, you'd be lost in there forever. This really is a, a, a labyrinth. Um, and the walls are reactive, and the fluids are reactive, and stuff is coming through all the time and reacting. And when it's reacting, it's making the molecules of life. And those molecules of life are 
interacting with each other and reacting and 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 effectively going on to make cell like structures which are the the kind of the building blocks of life are the cells that make us up i understood <laughs> <laughs> so uh so uh, you spoke about there is a lot of scenarios so you and you said that you are probably you believe you are right so but what are the chances that you give to the scenarios do you give like five percent to these and four percent to these no i don't worry about that very much i mean one one thing that uh that is kind of interesting to me when i when i when i you know do a video or something or do a podcast there's going to be a bunch of quotes which which say things like uh, you know he says this may happen or that might happen or this could be and, and 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 you know there's always people who are going to say oh he doesn't know what he's talking about um and and that's true um because we're talking about stuff which is four billion years ago and we can't just build a time machine and go back and look at it and even if we could build a time machine all the people working in the field will squabble with each other about where we should send the time machine. Should we should we go to a Darwin's warm pond, or should we go to the bottom of the ocean, or up into the atmosphere? So there's you know there's lots of ideas, and they're basically competing with each other. And that's actually what science is: it's a load of competing ideas, and people test the ideas as well as they can. And the ones which are more credible and believable, gradually you can say, well, this idea doesn't really work. There's these big problems with it. This one works better. And, and and so you know over over 50 years or something you've gone from not knowing very much to never knowing the answer but at least having a better feel for how things might be and the whole lot would seem like it's pointless stupid arguing among people who pretend to be experts except then someone makes a, an airplane or a television or a nuclear bomb or whatever it may be and you realize that these ideas that seem like they are just squabbling among people in an ivory tower or something, you know, they're real. You know, science is real. It's about real things. And it's the same process that allows us to try and reconstruct how did life start on a wet, rocky planet? We don't know. We'll never know for sure, but we can kind of put together a, a, a testable structure that will say, okay, 95% certain it was like this. I don't think we're very close to being able to say that yet. But uh, I, I kind of feel like move forward 50 years – some people will tell you five years or two months or something. I don't think they're right. But move forward 50 years, half a century, I would say we would have a pretty good idea of how life started on Earth by then. Okay, so you think giving these chances is not, it doesn't make sense uh, to, to do that uh, thought because we don't know this is the most uh, likely with the arguments that you heard, uh, heard that you believe this is the truth. So if you believe all the other stuff are false, why to give all the uh, kind of uh, chances to it? So uh, I will. So now we can make life on a lab, right? Uh, no, not really. Depends what you define as life. Um, if if you want, if you're thinking about life as as a bacterial cell or as something that we would reckon, you know, a, a normal, reasonable person would recognise as life, we're a long, long way from doing that in the lab. If you define life in such a way that says, okay, well, life does this and it does that, and here's a system that does this and does that, therefore it's alive. Yeah, maybe, but most normal people wouldn't recognize that as being alive. So so to make cells that have got genes and proteins and information and, and, and molecular machines that do things like ribosomes that build proteins, we're miles away from being able to do that yet. Miles away, decades away. Maybe we can never do it. Um, but that doesn't mean to say we can't understand it or we can't do bits of it. And if you do enough bits... Uh, then you can intellectually join up the bits and say, okay, well, if this is true, then this must happen, and and and, and I can show you that that does happen, and, and, and you know, so it's very, you know, to anyone who's not in the field, that would be very unsatisfying, but to someone who spends their life trying to work out, well, what are all these damn little steps along the way? Um, how do you prove that this one really does happen? And it could take years in the lab just to do that step. Um, so it's. <laughs> I don't think we're anywhere close to making cells come crawling out of reactors. Interesting, but maybe we can do the environment uh, that will produce the cell? Uh, 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 a bit. <laughs> and that's what we try and do in the lab. But is we, 
is not working as far as no uh, so 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 imagine what we're trying to simulate we've got a planet it's a wet rocky planet it's the earth four billion years ago um it's mostly ocean it's you know it's being hit by meteorites the oceans are broiling the moon is quite close the tidal range is huge we're down at the bottom of the ocean the entire sea floor is reacting with the oceans <laughs> Uh, and, 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 you know, there are hydrothermal vents everywhere that you look. This, this is your laboratory, and this is going on for how many millions of years would you like this to go on? If you want 500 million years, easy. I'll give you 500 million years for an entire ocean floor of a planet. Now, let's simulate that in the lab. And first of all, there's no oxygen there, so, 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 so we need to do this in, in an oxygen-free environment. It's not so easy to do that either. You need a, what's called a, a glove box, an a anaerobic glove box, which is this big. <laughs> um, and, and then you've got gloves and you do your experiments in there and, and you need to do it between your fingers. So you've got a little reactor, which is this big. And you say, okay, well, I think the most important things about all these vents on the seafloor is this barrier between this fluid and that fluid. And I'm going to see if I can make a reaction happen between here and here. And if I can measure the, the bits that the, the, the chemistry that's happening. Um, you know, it's crazy. If you if, if life starts on, on the entire planet and we, we try and abstract one little bit of it and do it in, you know, a PhD student's three years, four years in the lab, of course we're not doing it. <laughs> but but are we making no progress at all? Yes, we are making progress. Yes, we, we are putting things together and beginning to understand it. But, you know, we can't, we can't simulate a, 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 the, the planet as a laboratory. So... Uh, so if we want to take life to a different planet, we can do that, but we cannot create their life to a different planet. We can take it with us and maybe, like, how do we put life to Mars? I don't understand. Uh, well, bacteria will stick on the outside. They can survive on the outside of the International Space Station. People have done that experiment. They'll survive on a, you know, if you want to send a rocket to Mars, you know, there'll, there'll be some doubts as to whether the crew will survive or not, but there's no doubt that the bacteria on the outside of that spacecraft are going to arrive safely in Mars. So, uh, you know, they're really robust things. Um, and it would be very difficult to send things to Mars and not actually contaminate the planet. Oh, interesting. So maybe this is how we have origin in life as well here. Maybe someone tra traveled here with a spaceship. And they died immediately after. <laughs> One of the most famous scientists of the 20th century, Francis Crick, uh, the guy who discovered the structure of DNA with, with, with Watson, um, that's it. he wrote a book called Life Itself, which was exactly that. It was what he called directed panspermia, which is to say some alien sent a rocket with bacteria on it just to seed life on Earth. Uh, so even... You know, the most celebrated, distinguished scientists come up with crazy ideas, which are almost certainly not true. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's funny. It, it, this field drives people to strange places. But always maybe a strange place, maybe the, that's the path. Always it looks strange <laughs> before. Yeah. And then everyone says, oh, yeah, it was obvious. Obviously, it was like that. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you know, there's there's a there's a thing about this this field. I, I said we'll never know the answer because we 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 won't ever build a time machine that goes back and and looks. Um, but we can understand intellectually how life might have started, and eventually we can probably agree with each other about how it started. But the other thing to realize is that science is based on assumptions. It's it's not based on science itself. There's an assumption underpinning work on the origin of life, which is that life started on Earth. Um, because, you know, there's no evidence that life didn't start in space and get brought to Earth. There's no evidence that it wasn't brought here by a rocket from some aliens and that it arrived on Earth or that it was seeded by maybe not bacteria from space, but by chemicals coming from space, which we know for a fact were being delivered from space. So... So how can we begin to organize what we know? And the answer is, well, we, we just say, right, I assert <laughs> life started on Earth and it started in these conditions. It was a wet, rocky planet. 
that everything we know about geology says that's true. So why do I assert life starts on Earth? Because then I can do an experiment. Then I get out of bed in the morning and I say, okay, well, we can try and mimic the conditions on Earth. We know roughly what they were like. We know what life on Earth is like. Um, can we do some experiments to join up the two? So it's really, this is how science works. It's about making an assumption that life started here rather than coming from space. Uh, and then you do some experiments. And, and it's possible to disprove in principle, you could disprove that life started on Earth. You could, you could, in principle, prove that there was something so badly wrong about the conditions here that it could never have started on Earth and therefore must have been delivered from space. But I don't think that's going to happen. But it, it's, uh, you know, the, when I say life didn't start in space, it's not because I know it didn't. It's because it doesn't help us. If it started from space... Where did it come from? How long did it take? What kind of planet was it? Was it actually a planet at all, or was it in the middle of a sun somewhere? You know, <laughs> it could be anywhere in an infinite universe with any set of conditions that you want, and somehow it just arrives here, uh, God knows when. So instead of actually having a question that you can do something about in the lab, you now have, you know, you know absolutely less than nothing, <laughs> and then it's not science anymore. I understand. First of all, I, I see how much passion you have about this topic. It, it's, it's crazy. It's great did, fun. <laughs> did you always have this, this about the, uh, passion about this topic from a young age? I had no idea when I was young that I would ever be allowed to work on a question as mad as the origin of life. I mean, it, it's just not, you know, I was, I was very excited about science when, when I was a kid. And I, I remember reading a book. I, I didn't understand really very much of it at all, but it was about how do we know the Earth is four and a half billion years old? And, and what a book. <laughs> I didn't even know that it was possible to ask the question. <laughs> and so that's the great thing about science is it's possible to ask questions that are just crazy. How can we know that? It's it's. You know, how, do, how do we know even basic things like what, what when when did oxygen appear in the atmosphere? And yet we, we have a fairly good idea but it's just amazing science that, that that people do that allow you to ask these questions so i had no idea when i was at school uh about those questions um and it wasn't until years later and actually weirdly in my own case it was from writing books more than from being a scientist so i, I you know i'd done a phd uh it was actually biomedical stuff to do with organ transplantation um, which may sound like it's a million miles away, but actually it was to do with how energy works in the body. And if you take an organ out and put it on ice for two or three days, you deprive it of oxygen, it stops breathing, you may say, uh, and then you put it in again and it starts working again. So, But sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it breaks down. So how do you know why it broke down? Or how does how does respiration actually work at the level of, the mitochondria inside cells, these powerhouses inside cells, which were bacteria once, which take us back very quickly to early evolution and <laughs> questions like the origin of life. So you, there's another nice thing about science is you can one day be working on how kidney transplants or liver transplants work. And the next day you can use that same body of information to say, how did life start on earth? <laughs> And why one organ fails and another organ doesn't fail when you put it on a, a eyes? Ah, good question. Um, I mean, it, it depends partly on, uh, you know, how old was the donor, how how well was the donor, uh, how how long is it on ice it matters is it is it is it one day is it two days those kind of things and then the, there's other things that will make an organ fail as well like um if if the immunology is not matched up very well then it would reject so if you're able to completely suppress the rejection then you can see these other problems that you stored it for too long and it went wrong um and the problem there is actually the same problem that you have if you have a heart attack or if you have a stroke um or even if you've got rheumatoid arthritis, it, it's it's what's called ischemia reperfusion injury. And all that means is you cut off the blood supply. And you do that if you take an organ out of the body, you cut off the blood supply. Now it's not having oxygen delivered second after second, minute after minute. Um, and, and, and then, you know, for a while, it's effectively just decaying and breaking down. And this happens if you have a heart attack. Your heart is breaking down. Um, and then when you reintroduce the blood supply again, it's a kind of a shock to the system. 
and it's it's worse to have the blood restored to it than it was before the blood was you know it leads to a kind of catastrophic collapse if you're not careful um and and that can be the same with a heart attack or a stroke if you if you suddenly allow the blood to come back in it can make things worse for a while so i i'm sure this is a stupid question but since we can put uh, uh an organ in ice can i put myself in ice and come back after 10 years no wow. i mean you can't put it well you you put a, an organ in ice for two days and that's your limit three days maybe at can the moment I go, in, in ice go in ice for three days um no because your entire system would would effectively s stop so i mean in, in in some sense yes you could but it wouldn't be just a case of put yourself in ice you would need to have perfusion fluids going through you in principle yes it would be possible to do that in practice if you just you know jump into an icy um pond or something uh you will just die of hypothermia <laughs> so but don't don't try it at home <laughs> <laughs> okay so the, what they're trying to do now the scientists i heard some people that they're frozen after they die or be like the, yeah. this is this is stupid stuff you believe um well I, i mean it's definitely true that some people have had themselves frozen so there's a difference between putting something in a bucket of water with ice in it and trying to freeze someone so that you can come back in a hundred years when we figured out how to do it. Um, it's, it's possible to do that with cells. It's possible to do it with bits of organ. Uh, it's not really possible to do it yet with a whole organ. Um, you can't do it with a kidney, for example, uh, and you can't do it with a whole head or with a whole body. And the hope is the people who've had themselves frozen, the hope is, well, we'll figure it out. Give, give us a hundred years and we'll figure out how to make it work. Um, there's actually some really weird and difficult problems with the way that water freezes because if if water if this if this bit of water here forms an ice crystal it goes through a phase transition from being liquid water to being solid and that releases energy which makes as heat so it heats up the water that's next to it and makes it less likely to freeze um and if you're doing it the other way around and you start thawing it out when when it goes from being frozen to being liquid, um, then that effectively is absorbing a little bit of energy, which makes it more likely that the things around will will freeze. So if you what you're trying to do is, is really not have ice crystals, not have um, which which will kind of literally poke holes in things. So you, you what you want it to do is just be what's called viscous, like glass. You want a glass-like state, and that means everything has to defrost or, or freeze or unfreeze almost simultaneously. And it's very, very difficult, borderline, physically impossible to do that. It should be possible, but it is very hard. So it doesn't violate the laws of physics to do that? No, but it, it, because we're dealing with phase transitions between solid and liquid and viscous states, whenever you change a condition, you're, you're, you're releasing energy or absorbing energy. And that means that the stuff which is right next to you is now put into a different state to the one you are. So what you want to do really is right across the whole thing, do everything all at once, all in one go. But the reality is this bit happens and that prevents it happening here. And then that bit happens and prevents it there. And so it becomes immediately lumpy, you might say. And then that's where you get ice crystals forming and they will spear cells and you know it becomes messy. So it become it's unlikely that it will be possible soon. It would require a, a kind of intelligence about how to do it on a on a a kind of level of almost angstroms to say, okay, if I do this, then I need more power here. I need less power. If you were able to do that and figure out, if you could calculate oh, exactly the scale of which is happening that. and provide differential amounts of energy across that scale, <laughs> then you could do it for sure. So in, in principle, yes, you could do it. In practice, it would require, I mean, it's beyond the human mind. It, it would be possible that AI could figure this kind of thing out. Interesting. Wow, what, a, what an interesting... Yeah, <laughs> but the, then you need the, uh, the right machine that can do all this stuff, and that becomes a different story <laughs> on that. So, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I wanted to ask you so badly about 
what uh, what do you think about consciousness where do you think <laughs> <laughs> where do you think it fits with all this biological stuff that you are studying uh weirdly i've been thinking quite a lot about this recently um uh, it's not easy to give you an answer, but uh, the question to me is a very interesting question, really. And 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 you'll you'll have heard this from lots of people. You know what 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 are, what are feelings in biochemical terms, in materialistic terms? If I feel pain or hunger or lust or whatever it may be, um, what actually is that in 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 in, in, in the laws of nature as we know them? And we don't really have an answer. No one, again, it's like the origin of life. No one can agree about the answer. There's lots of ideas out there, but nobody agrees about really what the answer is. And there's a couple of things that I would say. One of them is, well, I think it evolved, which is to say, uh, I, I, I'm not a religious person. I don't think God said ding and we became conscious. Um, I think that... The consciousness is something which is shared by a lot of animals, actually possibly most animals and maybe even things like bacteria, not as we understand consciousness, but as some 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 form of feeling. Um, so so if it evolved, and I, I suppose if, if you were to say, you know, do you think a chimpanzee is conscious? Can it feel pain? Obviously, a chimpanzee can feel pain. Um, say, same with a dog or a cat or whatever it may be. So feelings we can we we can tell that they are real and they're widespread um and and therefore they evolved and the question is well are they a product of those of, the, of a brain of a central nervous system uh and if they are then what is the currency what are they actually made of and it's not just a case that we have a neuron which fires uh, and there's a neurotransmitter or something which is let's say serotonin or or, or something dopamine whatever it may be and that gives rise to a feeling why why would a you know why would this chemical make you feel anything at all there's no obvious reason for it um so so i go back and back further and further and think well what if 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 select if natural selection is acting on something um how far back can we go does it have to be a product of a central nervous system or could it be something that goes back even further to say bacteria and i think that it does go back i think it's a property of life that's the first thing to say i don't i don't think that a rock or the sun is conscious um but i, I think what, what it's really doing is is trying to tell you how how you're doing in relation to your environment now and, and the, the bottom line of it is, uh, am, am I okay or am I really bad? Am I in pain or am I, um, am I okay? And that boils down to, you effectively, think of it, I think of a bacterial cell. How am I doing as a bacterial cell in relation to my environment? Is it too hot? Is there a toxin here? Um, uh, and there's various automatic responses that will go off. So if it's too hot, there'll be a bunch of genes triggered and they are going to make proteins which are going to deal with the heat. Uh, and, and, and so you could say, I'm a bacterial cell. All this automatic process has just happened. How do I know which process has just happened? How can I, and how do I know if they're going to solve the problem that I have or not? I'm too hot. I don't know if I'm too hot or not. I've just done something. I don't know what it was. What am I going to do? Am I going to stay here and boil or am i going to move over there so you've got to have a kind of premonition you've got to have a an idea in some in some vague sense you've got to have an idea of what my problem is and what am i going to do about it and you can't wait for two hours for all those genes to be switched on and make proteins you've got to decide now i think i'm too hot i'm going over there so that feeling of heat that feeling of you know this this is a this is a physical state of the bacterial cell and it's a property of the whole cell and the network and the charges on the membranes and those things. So it's it's not the property of any one molecule. It's not it's not a, it's not one moment change. It's the whole cell, its vibrational state or or its electrical state or fields or whatever they may be, saying, "Too hot, go." <laughs> so, as I understand, you believe it's an illusion 
that we have. Uh, no, it's a prediction. It's a prediction about your state in the world is that from the information you have now, which is not very much, that the best action for me to take is that. So there's a bunch of physical states that a cell is in, and this one corresponds to I'm too hot. This one corresponds to as a toxin, it's killing me. Um, and it's really not so much that you know that is the case so much as the state you're in suggests that the best prediction to make about your state in the world is I am too hot. Therefore, I'm going to move over there and see if I'm less hot. And that in, uh, its, you know, that in a nutshell is what a feeling is. I'm hot. <laughs> that's, the, that's a bacterial level of feeling. What a feeling is, actually. I'm, I'm a bit confused what a feeling is. Right. So I'm staying with bacteria because that's what I can understand. I can't, actually, I can't understand bacteria either. But I, I, you know, I, the central nervous system is way beyond my capability of grasping it. But so I simplify it to a single cell. And that single cell, it's got a membrane around the cell. So you can think of it as a, a bag with a membrane around it. And inside that cell, well, there's, there's metabolism. There's all these chemical reactions I was talking about. There's a billion reactions every second happening there. So if you were to shrink yourself down to the size of a molecule and go and stand at one end of this cell, then the other end would like be like being on the other side of London or something, or the other, the other side of New York or Athens or wherever it may be. Um, you, you're a long, long way away, uh, and uh, and yet somehow y you're part of the same cell, and, and and the entity which needs to make a decision: Am I going to go over there or stay where I am? Am I going to activate this little paddle and, and paddle over there, or do I just stay where I am because it's good here? You've got to make that decision as a cell, not as a billion reactions in a second, every second, but as a as, as a network decision. So how do you know what the state of the network is? Well, there's one easy way that you can tell what that state is because that's the charge on the membrane around it. That's the barrier between the outside world and the inside of the cell. This is the thing which is telling you, here's the environment, here's me, uh, and, and, and this is the boundary around me, like, the, like my skin. But for a bacterial cell, it's the, it's, it's the membrane. And that membrane... Um, it has an electrical charge on it, and that electrical charge is a kind of summation of everything that's happening inside the cell. It's a kind of a readout of how am I doing. And it's got a charge to it, and it's got an electrical field because it's composed of, uh, of moving, moving charge. And it's effectively, if you can read that, which is to say it's an electromagnetic field generated by the cell membrane, which is which is giving you a, a real-time feedback on how am I doing in relation to the world. That is telling you, okay, I think it's too hot. This, 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 this charge on the membrane is giving me this information. It may be wrong, but I need to act now, otherwise I'll boil. Therefore, I think it's hot. And that's effectively, in my mind, what the simplest possible imaginable kind of feeling is, it's a bacterium integrating all the information it has about its state in the environment and saying, it's hot. My best guess, my prediction for the world is I'm too hot. I should move over there. So it's a property. It's just a property that helps us uh, function better. Uh, you, you're predicting information that you don't have yet because you you don't really know you, you you're guessing on the basis of your state now as to what your problem might be and if you don't have a problem you don't feel anything <laughs> if you do have a problem you feel something which is to say i have a problem that's kind of the limit of it um and the question is what are you going to do about it and the answer is i'm going to activate my paddle and paddle over there okay uh, i I find it very interesting, but I'm a bit disappointed that <laughs> all that all this stuff that I feel that is all my world around the stuff that I am aware and I, I'm not like a robot just doing stuff uh, is like just a, a property that it helps me to predict better the, few, the, few, the future in a way. <laughs> Well, remember, I'm talking about bacterial cells. I mean, if, if a bacterial cell was capable of being you, then you've got something to be worried about. But, uh, you know, all, I, all I'm asking is, 
is what your brain is an amazing thing the feelings that you have are are are, you know very difficult to understand even for people who spend their entire lives studying neurobiology and thinking about these questions Uh, and i haven't done that i don't you know I've, i've been telling you about the origin of life i'm not working on the brain um but but uh, it, it is just one of those really big, interesting questions in science: is uh, you know what what is the mind? What what is consciousness? Um, and and it becomes an evolutionary question as soon as you accept that animals are conscious, that it's not necessarily just a central nervous system which is producing this. I mean, you know, there's there's, there's two two answers in the literature. One of them says it's a property of the central nervous system, in which case it's effectively an, an illusion, which is to say the central nervous system is concocting something and, and, and conning you into thinking that you're, you, you have feelings. I don't find that a very pleasing answer. The alternative, which you often see, uh, is, is called panpsychism, where, where, where you say, oh, everything's conscious, the sun is conscious, this rock is conscious, whatever it may be, it permeates the universe. I don't find that very persuasive either because I don't think a rock is conscious. But what what do I think then is or can be? I think it's a property of living things and it's really the simplest possible imaginable form of it is really about how, how am I doing it? Will I die if I do this or will I survive if I do this? And And I don't have much information to go on because I don't have a brain or anything like that. So, so, so given this very limited amount of information, I still have to make a decision. What am I going to do? And that's what I think a feeling is. It's kind of it's a summation of the available information you have as a best guess that I, I'm in trouble here. I'm going over there. Now, you you incorporate this bacterial cell inside a larger complex cell, what we call the eukaryotic cell. Now we've got hundreds of these things inside. And they've all got to speak to each other and communicate with each other. And then you've, you've got to communicate with the cell membrane as well and the rest of this new cell. And then you have a multicellular organism. And now we've got hundreds, thousands, millions, billions of these cells all trying to talk to each other, all with their own mitochondria inside. And it becomes an amazing, complex situation with all of this crosstalk between different levels of organization. And then you have a central nervous system, which is you drawing on the communications between these different levels of entities that make up a body and now it's taking it up another level to interact with the environment in a in a, in a way where you're 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 really making predictions about what's going to happen if i do this and a lot of our lives is is led that way if i do this what will happen if i you know and anything you decide to do you have a mental image of what's what's what what, what might the possible outcomes be should i step in front of this bus should i kiss this person should i run a mile whatever you know what what am i going to do you have a mental projection as to what the outcomes might be so a lot of it's about predicting what you think the future might hold for you if you do this and and from a biochemist's point of view the question is why if i think i'm going to do this do i have a feeling which is terrible <laughs> Or which is painful, or or, or 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 which I love having. You know what? Are, you know what are the feelings that are associated with these mental projections? And I think they go way back. I think they go right back to the beginnings of biology, and actually back even to the origin of life. How does a person yes. like you studies the origin of life? Do you meditate? Do you get DMT? Do you read papers, or do you read history? Like, what is the way that someone can study this topic? And uh, well, I I do read some history, but uh, that's not the way to study the topic. Um, we do experiments, um, and, and any experiments we think we can do, and it's it's usually not me doing the experiments. I've got a lab group around, um, and and we talk about what experiments to do, and we think of things. Um, very often, they they're coming from the students, smart kids who are just you know full of enthusiasm just going into this with a with a with a career ahead of them um so it's great fun you know this is this is a wonderful thing to be in a university uh, being paid um i teach as well and, and the research i have a lab group around me you have to work quite hard to attract people to come and work on a crazy subject like this um and and then and then we talk and we think of experiments and we do the experiments and we try and work out what did that mean and how does this relate to that one and can we put together a bigger picture that makes sense of these two different parts they don't seem to have 
sit comfortably side by side. So where's the truth lie? So a lot of talk, a lot of thinking, a lot of experiments, um, a lot of failed experiments that you spend a lot of time trying to work out why did that not work? <laughs> what could I do differently that might make it work? Should I abandon these ideas because they're obviously wrong? Or is there just a little sliver of hope that it's not necessarily wrong, we just did the wrong experiment? Or we did the right experiment, but we used the wrong ingredients or whatever it may be. You know, There's so many reasons why you can do something wrong. Give me one example of an experiment uh, that you did that you found very interesting. Um, well, one that um, one that comes to mind is uh, one that we did with what's called the universal energy currency of life. It's called ATP, um, and it's normally made now. It's made in our own mitochondria, and there's an amazing machine that is. It's actually a, a rotating motor called the ATP synthase, and it's basically what's keeping us alive. It's What it's doing is is adding a phosphate group onto a thing called ADP, so it's just basically you've got a, a, a kind of a tail, a charged tail of three phosphate groups linked together. And when we want to power some protein to go dunk, dunk and change its state, we cut off the terminal phosphate, and that releases a little bit of energy that allows the protein to do this, or, or you know, all kinds of things along those lines. Um, and so the question, one question at the origin of life is, well, where did the ATP come from? How do you make it? We don't have a protein. We don't have a molecular machine, a rotating motor. Um, and there was a study done 25 years ago by a Japanese group who showed that if you got a rusting electrode um, and you happen to have ADP, which is to say two phosphate groups attached to this thing, and you got a, a small um, a small molecule with just two carbons in it called acetyl phosphate, then you made ATP. It just appeared there. They measured it and, and it was just appearing there. And so I said a rusting electrode. It had to be a rusting electrode because they found out that the, the, the catalyst that was doing it was rusted iron. It was what's called ferric iron. So we wanted to repeat that and see they were not thinking about the origin of life. This was just an observation that they'd made while studying something else. But we thought this is relevant to the origin of life. Um, so we, we thought we'll start out by repeating that experiment. And the student who was working on it, she's called Silvana Pinna, uh, it took her about six months, if I remember rightly, to make this experiment work again, which is one of these things in science. It's, it can be really difficult to repeat other people's experiments because they always left something out of the results section or the methods section or whatever. And, you know, there's a long time ago and, and, you know, you're in a different lab for one reason or another. I always feel very pleased when we're able to replicate someone else's study. And if you fail to do it, there's two possible reasons. Number one, they made it up. Or number two, you did something wrong. And you'd like to think that not many people make it up, but sometimes they do. Um, normally you do something wrong. And sometimes we can't even repeat our own experiments. And I know because I was there uh, that we did them right the first time. And the problem then is why doesn't it work the second time? So she did this. She managed to make ATP. Um, uh, and, we, and we got the same results that uh, that, that they'd got. Uh, and then she went on to try, instead of this little two carbon um, thing with a phosphate on it, which will which will add a phosphate onto ADP to make ATP. Um, she tried about 10 other what are called phosphorylating agents. None of them worked. And, and she tried a different set of metal ions. So instead of the, the ferric iron, the rusting iron that she'd used, she tried, um, she tried copper and she tried zinc and magnesium and calcium and, and you know, 10 of them. Uh, uh, and, and none of them worked either. Only the ferric iron that originally worked. So so it's, it's a whole load of negative experiments. And then she tried, uh, there are ATP, it's called adenosine triphosphate. And it's, it's also part of the genetic code. So we have, you'll have heard of the letters in the genetic code. We have an A and a T and a C and a G and so on. And they're all, they all start out as the triphosphate. So we have ATP, we have CTP, GTP, UTP, and we cut off a couple of phosphates, join them together, and that's how you make DNA or RNA. Um, so can we phosphorylate those other ones, those other letters? And the answer was, no, no, that didn't work either. <laughs> so here's a whole catalog. This is a year, year and a half has gone by now. 
Uh, and, and what she's done is repeat someone's experiment from 25 years ago, which took a while, and then demonstrate that absolutely nothing else works at all. <laughs> and you think, well, what a lot of negative results. This is science on a daily basis. Nothing works. Um, and then you step back and you say, okay, <laughs> a load of failed experiments here. What can we learn from this? And the answer is, well, why is, why is ATP, the universal energy currency, why is it preserved by everything across all of life? And, is, and the answer is, is because it, it works. It's the only thing that you can do in a lab, in a, in a bottle of water, without any of the machinery around, anything else around. All you need is a metal ion um, and ADP and, and, and acetyl phosphate, and it works. And it's still preserved there in all of biochemistry across the whole of life. And it's the only thing we could make work. It doesn't mean to say it's the only thing that could ever possibly work, but it kind of says, well, this is funky. <laughs> this works and everything else doesn't work in our hands. So maybe there's something special and favored about this reaction. And maybe that's why life uses it. Well, it's a discovery in a way. I don't know. <laughs> I see it as a discovery, not like a failure. <laughs> yes, but, but you know, it, it's, it is a, it's a failure in the sense that all the experiments didn't work. <laughs> and it's a discovery in the sense that when you put it in the context and you say, why, why do they not work? Then it tells you something about the world. So negative experiments can be really helpful. Um, but that's the kind of, I'm giving you an insight into a daily basis of what it's like being in a lab. And this is kind of a year and a half, maybe two years worth of work to do all of that. So there's a whole bunch of negative results, which tells you something interesting about the world. And it's hard to be kind of motivated in that one and a half year to keep doing this stuff without uh... <laughs> uh, yeah i mean it's it's kind of a problem um it's very easy doing a phd to get pretty depressed you know something <laughs> we have to go on training courses as supervisors to make sure that we recognize the signs of depression in our our, our phd students to make sure that we you know we 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 we, we look out for it and make sure they're okay. Because you can reliably know that a PhD student working on a difficult project is going to be depressed in the second year. They're going to go through a really low period. Um, and and <laughs> that's life. Um, but, but at least you can try and help people deal with it. Artificial intelligence yeah. is, does, has anything to do with your work of biochemistry or is a is a technology thing that uh, doesn't have anything to do with what you are doing um it does uh, i'm not doing myself very much with it uh, i'm kind of linked with some people who are a little bit so you could say, you know, if you were able to to semi-industrialize the, the kind of experiments I've just been talking about, if you were able to do that on a big scale, automate it, and make decisions about what experiments should you do next, that's a kind of a you know an opportunity to use AI to guide your direction in the lab. Um, I I'm too I was going to say I'm too old. Um, I'm behind the curve on that one. Uh, and, 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 and so I, tap, I find myself thinking, what am I going to be good at doing that AI is not so great at? Um, <laughs> hey, where, what you, you came know, it, up with, the, what's the answer on that? <laughs> well, I don't know how good AI is at creativity, as a kind of a creative spark. I mean, you, you know, you see all this AI art and all of these things, which it does pretty well. But in some sense, it's not creative. It's a blend of this and a blend of that. And they come up with something interesting and new. But, you, you know, then there's all this arguments about where did they but nick it from and who, who is isn't that what our creativity is anyway <laughs> yes it probably is but it, well i'm sure it is but the i i think what ai is doing is seeing patterns in data largely still maybe in future it won't be and if you've got massive massive data sets you'll see patterns and you'll see them better than we can see them uh, and you know it's being used in medicine to say, oh, this is a, this is a tumor. Catch it early. You know you, this this little kind of smudge here reliably is, is going to indicate that it's a cancer. Um, but then questions, you know, a lot of questions. There's, there's there's whole areas that are just missing. There's no data. There's no patterns to be seen. There's just nothing there. Uh, and it's an interesting question in science: is how do you link up these two fields where there's nothing in between? 
And that's a kind of a human leap of the imagination that maybe if that could link these two fields, I could jump this, I could do that experiment. And, you know, it's, it's a kind of, there's a lot of creativity in science. It's often perceived as just kind of dull in some way. You, you, you find patterns in data. It's a lot more exciting than that. It's a lot more interesting than that. You, you, you're, you're trying to understand, you're trying to tell a story about how the world works. And, and I, I think there was a, forget who it was now, who said that the crea human creativity is a bit like the structure of a joke that you, um, you know, when someone's telling a joke, they, they lead you down a particular path and you're, 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 you're going towards an expected outcome. And then suddenly the punchline is over there. It's completely unexpected. They took you by surprise in the direction that it went. And it was a leap in an unexpected direction. Well, creativity is a lot like that. I think it was Arthur Kerstler wrote a book along those lines. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of truth in that, that, you know, a lot of what I spend my time doing is trying to dream up clever ways of finding an explanation in an area of science that we don't know much about yet. Uh, yesterday, uh, two days ago, I saw for the first time and I interacted in my life with a robot. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I was talking with it, it or he or her, I'm not sure <laughs> how. I, yeah. like, and it was a crazy experience for me. Like I, I saw all these videos and it's nowhere near uh, the feeling when you what you feel when you are in real life talking with the, uh, the artificial intelligence. I wanted to impress it uh, when I was talking. I was uh, so curious, so drawn to uh, what uh, he was saying. So it was it was an amazing experience. But what I'm trying kind of to touch. So do do these things can be in our bodies as well like i don't know in a human body that we can put intelligence like uh, do they need bodies or like uh, i'm trying to connect kind of your work with uh, yeah with the whole artificial intelligence i think it boils down to you know is is, is an artificial intelligence going to be conscious is it going to have feelings is it going to become more like humans are we going to have a fellowship, I suppose, uh, with, with, with AI? Um, and, and that kind of means, so So, what is consciousness anyway? And, and if you want to, if we can understand what consciousness is in humans, then can we program it in or will it, will it just appear? And, and, and I, I said before that it's often perceived as, as a, a kind of property of a sufficiently complex central nervous system. And I said that's an illusion, almost logically it's an illusion and i don't like that answer i can't say it's wrong um i just don't find it very persuasive um but if that's true and actually it's more like what i was saying that it's a property of of of, uh, of a living cell which is selected over generation on life or death decisions if i do this i i survive or i die that's the that's the essence of what a feeling is I, I, you know, I, I don't feel good. What am I going to do? I'm going to stay here. Oh shit, I'm dead. You know, <laughs> and it, and and you know, you feelings come from this association between your decision and the outcome from that decision. And and, well, and so I, it's. A, I, I, I want to stop you. Actually, maybe consciousness is not that advanced in a way it's just it's like it's just feeling and predicting about the future so uh, and all these feelings is just kind of a mechanism as as you were talking i was like oh yeah maybe it's not that interesting actually it's not that <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i think the 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 the, the thing is that it, it, it it's a state it's a survival state that tells you something about how you're doing in relation and if you get it wrong you 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 die and if you if you follow this instinct this this feeling and you get it right you so so will ai go through that because it's, then it then becomes an association between how i feel as an entity and what the outcome is do i survive or do i not survive and do I have gradations of I feel really bad <laughs> and I'm really going to die? Or do I feel only quite bad and I, I think I'll be all right to stay here because it'll be all right in a few minutes? And so, so you have a set of associations which is fashioned by natural selection over billions and billions and billions of generations of things that are living and dying. Um, and I don't know that there's anything in AI which is remotely similar to any of that. 
So I don't know that it'll ever generate that same association between a state of being alive and an outcome as to you may not be alive anymore. I don't think it's a property of a general, a general property, an emergent property of a complex central nervous system. I think it's about life or death in living organisms the, the need feelings to guide them in terms of what am I going to do next as a, as a decision. So I don't think it's going to emerge. There's, there's a lovely quote from uh, Richard Feynman, who was asked about AI, I think. And he said, well, you know, we, we make, uh, and, and this is 30, 40 years ago or something. He said, we, well, we, we, you know, we, we can make things that fly, um, but they don't fly like a bird. They don't have flapping wings. We have a, we have, we have a jet engine and it flies. And we can make things that move around at speed, but it doesn't run like a cheetah. It goes on wheels with a with with, with a combustion engine and so on. And so we we're able to make things that have equivalent function to what life is doing, but it doesn't do it necessarily anything like life does it itself. So why would we think that when we try to make a computer, a sufficiently complex one? That it would end up behaving in a, or, or feeling or, or, or having any properties that are really very similar to human properties. We we kind of already make things in a different way, uh, and I, I think the fact that they they're not living and dying on a generational basis and trying to figure out for themselves that was a really stupid thing to have done. Passing on the genes that says, okay, if you thought that was a good thing and you died, those genes don't go anywhere, uh, and, and so on. So. It, you know, you you select for associations over history about actions in relation to life and death, and I, I don't know that that happens in machines. Well, I'm not sure how close to this topic is, but free will, where does it f f fit in here? Do you uh, do you believe in free will first of all? Yeah, I think so. And not, I mean, I'm not a philosopher, and I don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. Um, but that, that, does biology and all this stuff that you study tells us anything about uh, if we have power over our actions? So let's. Um, I, I'm going to go back to being a bacterial cell again. This is my kind of fallback position, where I, where I, 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 you know I don't have a brain, I don't have anything to. So I, here I am, and, and, and I, I reckon this. <laughs> I've got three or four things about the world. It's too hot here, but there's there's lots of food here. I've got I've detected two things, uh, and, and, and there's a little bit of oxygen, but not very much. It's a bit hot. The oxygen doesn't dissolve. So I've got three bits of information. So am I going to stay or am I going to go? And I need to make up my mind in some way. But but also, if I stay or if I go, it depends on how good am I. Uh, you know, am, am I actually old and decrepit and falling to pieces? In which case, staying here longer, uh, maybe that'll kill me. Or am I young and vigorous? And you know, in which case, staying here for longer, sure, I mean, I can do that. So, so you you make a decision based on the, the your information about the world and your knowledge of how you're doing in relation to the world. And and, and it's almost impossible not to see some kind of free will in that kind of decision making. I I, I make a decision. I may get it wrong. It's not an automatic thing that tells you okay, here's an algorithm that is going to sort this information out for you and tell you what to do. It's your decision. What am I going to do? There's a the march going on down in the street. I don't know if you can hear it. But, uh... but ah. the uh, you said the age of the how old you are, you are going to determine your decision as well. So a lot of outsider factors are determining that decision in a way, not you. And the um, place that you were in that uh, in that uh, particular time, as a cell that you described, so everything else kind of determine uh, your position in a way. Uh, yes, for us, for us, bacterial cell. Yes, but still, you have to you have to judge on those information. Am I going to? Uh, you got you know you got all of these bits of information coming in, and you have got a binary decision to make. Am I going to go or am I going to stay? That's your. That's your free will, if you like. Do I do I activate my motor and paddle over there, or do I stay where I am? And 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 it's it's a it's a decision which has consequences, and you don't know what the consequences are. And so a lot of conscious thinking is then about, well, if I do this, what will the consequences be? Um, 
And uh, you know, if I if I decide that I'm going to go for a run now and I'm going to try and break the record of running one mile or something, well, you know, ninety five percent likely I'll have a heart attack and die. Um, and and in any case, you know, hundred percent likely I'm not going to break the world record for one mile. And you know, what am I going to do then? Well, I have all these bits of information, and I I'm going to do something. I don't know what, but I'm going to do something. And and you know. It, to some extent, it's random. To some extent, it, you know, it's, there has to be a decision, and that decision that you decide. I'm okay. I'm going for a run. I think there's free will in that. Yes, I don't think it's that complicated. Can I clone myself now? Um, you can't, but uh, it can be done. Yes, um, it's it's kind of dodgy. It, It's probably been done. I mean, it has been done in the world, but how how successfully, I don't know. But yes, it, in principle, it can be done. In practice, it could be done quite easily uh, in future. Uh, and then it becomes more an ethical question about whether we should be doing that or want to be doing that or whether we all then get wiped out by some virus or whatever. I mean, there's a reason why why we are sexual, why we don't, why we're not all clones. It's interesting in biology, the things that are clones and dandelions, for example, are clones and some snails are clones and they always go extinct. It's only a matter of time before they go extinct. And it's really just that sex leads to variation and everyone's different. And it's a statement of the obvious. Um, and and that because we're all different, we all react in different ways to the environment and those around us and to viruses and to everything else. And you know, some people are always going to survive and some people are always going to die. And, and that's what natural selection is acting on. And that's why sex is great. It's uh, for an evolutionary mechanism. And cloning forgoes all of that. Cloning will lead to extinction. If we decide that we're going to just clone ourselves as a species, we don't want to have sex anymore, we just clone ourselves, then for a fact, we'll all be dead within 10 million years. I mean, we'll all be dead within 50 years if we go on as we are. So shouldn't worry too much about it. But <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, why do you believe you are, are going to be dead in 50 years? Well, I'm joking. But <laughs> I know, but, I know uh, you are you know, joking, but that was, uh, in a lot of jokes that people make, there is some truth to that. So what's the truth in that? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I've got, I've got, kids uh and you 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 think what kind of a world have i introduced these boys into um what's going to happen in the next 50 to 100 years you know climate change is real it's happening but we're also degrading the world you know we're polluting the oceans with plastics and we're you know we we, we have an amazing ability to destroy the stuff around us and there's too many of us and we we're too inequitable in terms of distribution of food or, or or just goods or whatever it may be we're going to have migration on a colossal scale um it's probably going to lead to war it's already leading to war um you, you know we have the wherewithal to solve all of these problems but to solve all of these problems we have to behave like civilized human beings and talk to each other and Um, come up with solutions that work for humanity and not for one favored group over some disfavored group or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, is that, can we do that? I'd like to think we can, but it's a problem in social sciences, not in science. It's a problem about how, how can we get along with each other and respect each other sufficiently that we don't all effectively die in a cataclysm within the next hundred years. It's not an optimistic view, but it's, it's not unrealistic. I hope that we can do better than that. I think we can do better than that. But, uh, I, I, you know, just to say I am optimistic about the future, I'm an optimist, I believe in optimism, oh, it's dangerous. I, I also am optimistic. I do think we can we can solve the problems of the world, but only if we actually really put our minds to it and act and do something and, and, and uh, find a way and take it seriously and, and, and uh, you know, prevent people from cheating or breaking the system. Um, and at the moment, we're not doing that. And we've shown no sign of doing that over decades. So I'm, in that sense, I'm, I won't say I'm pessimistic, but I'm worried. And since we are in this topic, well, I always ask uh, the guests on this podcast, I give you $1 trillion. How do you spend it? <laughs> 
to have the maximum positive impact currently in this world? Um, there was actually a book written um, by by a guy who works for New Scientist, and I think it, a trillion dollars was what he uh, what he was talking about as well. And 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 he was saying, well, what would it actually cost to fix uh, all these world's problems? And and it would comfortably come in within that kind of figure, which is a trivial part of uh, global GDP, I think, isn't it? I mean, in any case, what would I do? Um, I mean, I, I, I think we, we, we have very specific problems with with the health of the world that we live in with climate change and all the rest of it. I would want to fix those things. Um, but a lot of the problems that we have come from people disagreeing with each other. And, and that's not an easy thing to fix. And I think the only the only way of fixing how we deal with each other so that we do it in a better way is going to take decades and it's going to require serious investment in education. Um, so I would start out by doubling or trebling the salary of teachers. <laughs> I, I, I would try and give back the respect that they used to have in society. I would try to change the way that we teach completely so that instead of teaching a load of dusty, boring textbook facts about the world, I would try and teach it in terms of, well, what, what science really is. And, and, and you know, in, in terms of history, not just dry history from the past. In England, the history that we teach is very often British history, 19th century Gladstone and Disraeli. And, and most people have fallen asleep before you finish saying Disraeli. Um, you know, there's so much history in the world now. What are we going to do in in Palestine and Israel? How do we, how do we fix these? You know, so 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 you know, teach people about where is this conflict coming from? Why? How did it all arise? There's so many immediate problems that the history that's behind that. If we do that instead, it'll maybe have meaning to people. Maybe we someone will come up with better ideas. Maybe we're better informed about what we can do or should do. Uh, you know, so much. And instead, what we have is a, is, a, is a lot of misinformation, a lot of people who, through their schooling, have been not well equipped to, to discern between different stories, different competing hypotheses, you might say, as a scientist. I spend my whole day, here's three or four different ways of seeing this truth. <laughs> Which one's the right one? And I never know. I can't tell, but at least I'm trying to think about it. And and but it's not something that kids are taught in school. You're taught this is a fact. This is something to know about chemistry. But you know, why not start with a two slit experiment and we don't know which of these two holes the electron went through, uh, or why, or why we can go through both holes at once. It's much more fun, much more interesting. And it, it starts out by saying we don't know that much about the world. We have ideas, but it's just more exciting. I'd probably get rid of exams as well. This is not going to cost very much of your trillion. I, I, I would probably only got got through a couple of billion at this point, but uh, you you get the general gist of where I'm going. Yeah. So basically, to summarize what you said, focus and improve the education, make the education cool again, and uh, the That's structure. A good way of it. Uh, but by the way, when you were talking about this. I got, uh, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Because for example, now, is it, is it, uh, this is exactly how I learned about uh, uh, history the last couple of one, two years. I learned whenever it was the Russian yeah. conflict with Ukraine, I started learning about the, because it's interesting, it's relevant. Yeah. I started learning about the Vikings that came to Russia yes. and all this. So I was like, uh, I, and now with uh, Israel and all this stuff, it's like, it's relevant. You can get in class and every kid will be like, oh, that's interesting. I want to learn about that. Let's understand how this came to be. So finding relevant stuff that is happening in the world and talking about, or like the slit experience, like how is possible one thing to be going this and this direction? So, and just asking the question, yeah, I was like, I was, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it just feels like we can do so much better than we are and it's not really anyone's fault it's it's like uh you know they say about u.s politics that i think this was a while ago um 
98% of the US population do not want to see a rerun between Trump and Biden. Um, but that's what they're going to get. <laughs> and they're going to get that because the structure of politics is going to force that on them. Uh, and and, and the, these are real problems with how do you change the structure of things? There's so many structural problems with the world as it exists now. It's very, very difficult to know how do you begin to change it so that it's better. And I don't think anything happening very quickly is going to work. But if we don't, if we don't start soon, then it may be too late. So we, we need to, you know, what's the, what's the basic problem? You know, when I was a kid, America was respected in the world. And now it's more hated than respected. What's, what's gone wrong? And it's partly a kind of hypocrisy that's linked with, you know, the, the, the end of the Cold War, the decline of, 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 of Russia and the Soviet Union and so on. And, and people could get away with stuff in capitalism that they weren't doing before because you had some focus on the, the nation, on, you know, can, will, will, you know, we're all Americans, we're all Brits, whatever it may be, we're in this together. That kind of level of grouping that brings, I'm not sure if it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just that that has evaporated. And what we're left with instead is a, a lot of fairly selfish subgroups that are all after their own best interests and don't really care anymore. And what that means is that people behave with, with really, you know, two standards to, and uh, hypocritically. And and then any respect or trust that people have, you say you should behave like this, and you go and do the opposite. So of course you you don't get any respect anymore. So. How do we begin to redress that balance so we get back to more respectful dialogues? I don't know. Maybe, don't know you know, either. talking on know podcasts either. has got to be a step in the direction. It's, it's probably <laughs> pointless, but, you know, the more we talk with each other, the more we can begin to find a path. Who rules the world, you think? <laughs> um and I don't mean that uh, America or China or all, yeah. like who, who are the people, the powerful people of the world? Are they the politicians, the trillionaires, the uh, philosophers, the teachers? Like who is the? I mean, what I, what I was just been saying about structural problems almost says that no one's ruling the world. The, the problem is the kind of tectonic plates of society, uh, and they're very very difficult to shift how those plates relate to each other. So. Yes, we have a world where there's enormous power that billionaires have over the rest, but you know it's not as if they're dominating everything that's happening in the world, or or, or that any one country is dominating it either. There's lots of vested interests, but I don't know that you'd really say that we can't change those things around. If if people really want to, you know, if people want to vote for populist politicians, they you know they've got reasons to do that. They don't have to we can change things around and you know you can vote for them or not vote for them and democracy is still functional uh, the 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 problem that we have is that lots of people are sufficiently disenchanted that they think it's the best thing to do in their own interests i don't think it's the best thing to do in humanity's interest but when we kind of when we've lost respect because we have double standards then then you know why would you expect people to treat you with respect then why would we expect politicians who've eroded that public trust to be votable for and, and until we can turn around those are that's not who's ruling the world but that's about why is the public disenchanted with politics and politicians and university lecturers and you know one group after another the police whoever it may be um we have to change the tectonic plates. The problem is the way that you know whole, whole groups of people behave in relation to each other. That's what that's what's ruining the world. And, How do you really change the change. tectonic plate? I said education before, and I, I'm not sure there's a better way. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You said that from before, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would it work? I, I don't know. Uh, it'd be nice to think it could work, but it's not. Again, it's not as if we can just, you know, double the salary of teachers and and, and step back and everything's going to be better. Um, it, it would require a lot more than that, and it requires decades. And maybe that's too late. This is like the problem in consciousness. The bacterial cell it sets off all these things. It's going to change its gene expression. It's going to now make all of these new things. But if it doesn't move over there, it's too late. It's just going to die. 
And same for us. We, it's going to take a long time to make these changes happen. Um, we need to start them now. But in the meantime, we need a fix. We need a quick fix. Um, and and we better get on with it. So do you see a current state in the world that you describe like that in the United States and in the conflict and all this stuff? It's everywhere in the world, right? It's not only the England or... or mm. it's, or maybe do you think is everywhere the problem is not like in certain places uh it does seem to me that we're living in an angry age where where people are unwilling to listen to each other um unwilling to accept that our own viewpoints may be wrong or only partly right and that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle and that if we do listen to each other with some kind of respect, we may learn some stuff. Um, uh, what we seem to have in England, uh, and this was true of Brexit for sure, is, is uh, but also true of COVID, you know, the population seem to be split 50-50 between those who want something or those who don't want something. And, 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 and we're kind of barely on speaking terms with each other or shout at each other or shout past each other. And the same is true in France, and the same is true in in, in in the United States. And, you know, it just seems like populations are being split into two almost equal halves, where one half of the population is very disenchanted with the other half of the population. So the question then is, well, you know, what's generating that anger, that resentment, that uh, unwillingness to listen? And and how do we begin to turn it around so that people talk to each other and listen? And, you know, maybe maybe there's structural factors, again, like social media, whatever it may be, that that mean that we can seek friendships, not with those around us, but with people on the other side of the world who we're in touch with within, you know, who, who sympathize. So we end up in an echo chamber with like-minded people. So there's structural things like that. Um maybe we'll just accommodate ourselves to it over time and, and get better at dealing with the individuals around us again. But maybe we need to be more active than that and you know, reset society in some way that we begin to be more respectful to each other somehow. How do you do that? I, I, I don't really know. Would it even work? I don't know that either, but uh, but it, that feels like what it needs to. When I talk about the tectonic plates, if we want to steer them in a direction that's helpful, we need everyone on board. We 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 need to um, have dialogue and listen and understand and compromise and, and and see the other point of view. And that's you know, if there's a war situation, it's almost impossible to do that. But some peoples have done. You know, Northern Ireland, the peace process in Northern Ireland is one of the few beautiful examples where it seems to have worked. And I think it, a lot of people had to forgive and accept that the, the wrongs that they had in their lives were, were that I'm going to put it aside now for the sake of the future and, 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 and try to forgive. I'm not a Christian, but, but that kind of attitude of forgiveness is, is necessary. What what happened to this island? I'm not aware. Of Northern this Ireland. Situation. Well, there was a, there, there, there were um, a state of semi war over many decades. Um, over Ireland is 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 split into the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is part of Britain. It's split between the Protestants in the Northern Ireland and the Catholics in the South. These populations are changing. The European Union um, brought everything together, but then Brexit meant that there's a splinter line back in, in Ireland, um, which puts a lot of pressure on everybody about, um, you know, do you, do you want to be part of Ireland? Do you want to be part of Great Britain? Do you want to have a free movement of goods across this? Do you, you know, it, 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 it just puts so much strain on people who've been successfully living happily together. I mean, I'm being kind of naively stupid in saying that, but, but you know, 30, 40 years ago, there were regular bombings and 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 and, and murders and and and, and, and terrorism, um, and it was. If you go back into the context, you can understand why. But 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 again, is 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 these tectonic plates? How do you stop a process like that, which is grounded in real deep dislike, hatred, cultural differences, whatever whatever it may be? How do you begin to slow that down, turn it around, so that people 
begin to forgive and forget and live alongside each other. And and this was 30 years ago, uh, since the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and, and it led to a lot of politicians effectively stepping back from their positions and a lot of people f- forgiving the murderers who killed their loved ones. <laughs> it's... Uh, I don't know how people do that. I've never been in that position, but I, you know, it 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 worked, and it's now under strain again. Um, and and you know, it's it's far too raw in the Ukraine or in Palestine for anything like that to work. But in future, it has to. Otherwise, it never goes away and never stops. What makes you wake up every day? What <laughs> motivates you? Why you are doing what you are doing? Um. The questions. There's hmm. a load of wonderful questions, and I don't know what the answers are to them. And I would like to know what the answers are to them. I would like to know, in my own mind, how does a wet, rocky planet become alive, and how does a bacterial cell become conscious? Um, they're wonderful questions. Why are we all here? Why are we like this? How does evolution work? Um, People pay me to work on these questions, and that's an incredibly privileged and beautiful place to be. And I, so, so I, I wake up and I feel grateful that uh, that it's like this now. And maybe, maybe next week I have a heart attack, or maybe I get sacked for being incompetent. Um, but, but you know, now it's good. And uh, I suppose another thing that I want to get up for in the morning is I can, in a small way, try to inspire the people around me to to want to do similar things to want to be a scientist to want to do experiments to want to think about big questions to want to do it well to want to be honest to want to try and help inspire the people around them um to be a kind of a catalyst for positive change in the in, in a in a kind of society where where science is part of culture and where ideas and how to ask ideas how to how to test things is all part of what a good life could or should be so you know i'm in a very privileged position and if i can help inspire those around me or at least some of those around me that's worth getting up for and if i can also have fun doing it while thinking about big questions like the origin of life <laughs> well, you know it's it's great so i'm getting the sun in my eyes here i'm going to have to change my position somewhere It's not a problem. It's not a problem. Uh, no, okay. People uh, can't see you. It's okay. But if it's a problem for you, that's a different uh, conversation. <laughs> if you don't like the sun in your eyes, <laughs> I can. I, I'm just going to sit like this in a kind of rigid, upright state for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I am curious to hear. Uh, so you probably do a lot of. Uh, you. You said you have questions, you want to answer them. How do you learn about new topics? How do you, when you want to, uh, when you have a question, do you go to Google, do you ask friends? Like, uh, how do you go about answering questions? Now, all of those, um, talking to people. That's a nice thing about being in a university is there's plenty of people to talk to and you go to seminars and hear what people have to say. You talk to students. Um, You 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 discuss the lab work. You think about what am I going to do next. But but also, you you have ideas as well. And then you look it up. You look on Google first. That's the easiest thing to do. You find some papers about it. You read a bit of this paper. You're too tired to take it in, or you don't have time. You do something else. You put it aside. You find another one. Now my room is a complete mess. Um, And the things that are at the back of your mind that are turning around, they're the ones you keep coming back to and you keep asking those questions. And and you have another thought and then you look up another thing on Google or you look up another paper and you, um, over a period of weeks or months, I write thoughts down in, in a book and occasionally I look back in the book and think, what was I thinking? <laughs> so there's a lot of disconnected piecing bits and pieces of information together And turning around in the back of my mind, how do these fit together? How do these relate to each other? So basically, uh, it's a lot of different ways. That you, it's not one answer. It's like no, uh, no. 20, 30 things together. <laughs> It goes to your learning about the topic. Uh, so uh, when you, uh, how old are you now? 
56. Are you afraid of death? Um, not actively, but it's not something I'm looking forward to. Um, I'm, I'm not afraid of death so much as of having a stroke and becoming a cabbage. Um, so a, 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 an accident with health. Or just getting cancer. I mean, if you get cancer, you know, a good friend of mine who, uh, who was a year or two older than me died of cancer about three years ago, and it was terrible to to watch. And a few other people I know of my age have had cancer or had a heart attack and died. And you get to, I mean, how old are you? Younger, but... Uh, I'm 23. You, when, yeah, so you're immortal still. <laughs> <laughs> still. But when you get into your 40s, you suddenly realize that you, your lifestyle is not sustainable. That you, you know, you're, you're in your 40s, you, you're, you, you, you kind of maybe gave up doing serious exercise a while ago, but you're still eating too much, you're still drinking a bit too much, whatever it may be that you're doing. Um, and you suddenly realize, well, you're beginning to put on some weights and, and you're beginning to get breathless when you walk up the stairs. And then you realize that the, the guy over there just had a heart attack when he was walking up the stairs and he died. Um, you begin to realize you're mortal and that people of your age have a problem and that, and that actually being in your 40s is still middle-aged um, and, and that you can die and that the decisions that you make now are going to affect your future. So you begin to think, right, I'm going to go for a run. <laughs> and you pull a muscle in your leg and think, damn, I should, I should have gone for a run before. Uh, you know, you begin to work up. You, I, I go running now, maybe two or three days a week if I can. Now it's not far; it's a mile or two. It's really very little, but it makes a big difference. You begin to get stronger again, a bit fitter again. You walk up the stairs more easily. You begin to think, well, I should probably not have that <laughs> for a glass of wine tonight or whatever. I often do anyway. But um, you, you know, you you begin to realize that you've got to pace yourself, and you've got to if you don't want to die prematurely um brought on by your own lifestyle you've got to do something about it in your 40s or 50s or maybe earlier and, and i so, would say I'm, I'm now fitter and healthier than i was probably seven or eight years ago okay good so basically as i understood you you are not afraid of death but you are at a point that you understand that it's something that is coming you're trying to prevent it or for coming and finding you i'm trying to postpone it postpone it <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I don't really want to think about it. But am I afraid of it? Um, not in the sense that I know it's coming, and, and I I don't I, I'm not thinking. Oh, I, I've got to start working on anti anti aging therapies to try and help us all live forever. I know people who are doing that. I don't think they're going to get very far with it. Um, and I realize I have no desire to do that. Um, uh, and as far as I do work on it at all, which is a little bit, it's more out of curiosity to see, so what actually is going wrong? Why is it that this aging process is beginning to undermine our physical vitality? What actually is breaking down? Why? It's not It's not so much that I care about how do we put it right. I think that'll be very difficult. Uh, but, but I am interested in why is it happening? Um, and uh, uh, what are the complexities of it? Why is it so hard to change it? Uh, given that Evolutionary biology says it's not so hard. The reality is, it is quite difficult. Uh, so, so there's a there's a kind of an interesting scientific question that I do enjoy thinking about. So, I want to do a fun exercise. Okay, so you are mm -hmm. going to say some myths about your field, about the origin of life, or evolutionary biology, or all this stuff that people think and then you're going to say that uh, like make uh, tell me some myths that people think about this uh, about your field oh, well, maybe there's, bust, a, there's a very bust the myths <laughs> i mean for the origin of life there's a there's a, a big myth which is called primordial soup you you know you must have heard of primordial soup and you'll probably have heard of what's called the miller experiment which was where you have bursts of lightning in, a, in an atmosphere of gases that make the building blocks of life, the amino acids that make up proteins. Um, so one of them is a myth, and the other one is science. Um, but they're linked together. So the one which is science is the experiment that was done. 
by um, by, by Stanley Miller in 1953, uh, and, and you know he he got electrical discharges in flasks containing water to simulate an ocean, uh, and then and then various gases, hydrogen, methane, ammonia, and so on. And he thought, you know, this, this, the, the, the atmosphere of Jupiter is full of gases like methane and ammonia. And there would have been lots of electrical storms. Uh, so what happens if you've got an atmosphere with these gases and you've got an electrical storm? And you, you know, what do you get? Do you get, do you get the building blocks of life? And the answer was, yes, wow, you do. You get amino acids, quite a lot of them. Um, uh, and these are the building blocks of proteins. Uh, and, and they just kind of accumulate in the ocean. And this goes to the hypothesis that there was a primordial soup. And actually, it, it supported a, a hypothesis that there was a primordial soup. And that hypothesis came from, uh, well, two people, really, a, a Russian guy called Operin um, and, uh, and and a guy who was here at UCL, which is where I am in London, uh, called JBS Haldane. And, and they both came up with this idea independently, and Operin did a lot of work on it, and Haldane wrote one short essay on it that became quite famous because he was a very good writer and a very good scientist. Um, and it kind of captured the public imagination. Life starts in a soup, and the soup kind of thickens and congeals and you know does amazing things. Um, and it's a complete myth. Um, it's you know, there's hardly any reality in it, and it's still taught in schools. And it's um, you know, it, and so so what happens as part of this myth? Well, the next step is well, you make the building blocks of of of, of RNA, which is the the more reactive version of DNA, the hereditary material. And you have what's called an RNA world where you've got a lot of little squiggly RNAs that interact with each other and copy each other, and and then they invent all of life. And that's another myth. Um, it's, you know, there is a bit more truth in that one, but not much. Uh, it's just unworkable. Uh, and, and the reason it's unworkable is that whenever you just have what I would call naked genes, which is to say genes in a, in a, in a pool, um, they're always self-interested. They're always going to to um, act in their own interests, if you like. You need to clump them together, and you need to put them in a bag like a cell, and then and then they 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 they're forced to have a shared interest. And you know, you could say we're all in a bag, and our cell is the world, and we're forced to have a shared interest. Um, going back to the problems with the tectonic plates. Um, you know, thinking about these questions in biology, you have to think, well, how, how does all this naked RNA invent metabolism or invent the genetic code and all the rest of it? And, and you know, we don't have answers to those questions. And I think the reason is because there aren't answers to those questions because it happened a different way, which is why I say it's a myth. But you ask someone else working on the origin of life and they'll say, oh, no, no, he's got it all wrong. Of course, it's not a myth. It's real. We've done this and that and the other. Uh, so who do you believe? It's up to you. Um, but, you know, exercise your judgment about who you believe. <laughs> For me, a primordial soup in an RNA world is a myth. Uh, and uh, actually what has happened from the very beginning is we have cells really early on. They do the same biochemistry that we are still doing now. Uh, they made copies of themselves from the very beginning at the level of uh, as cells. They became bacterial cells and we go into evolution as we know it. So the myth is what people are taught in school and told to believe and told this is science and told that this is this is uh, what we know about the origin of life and the whole thing is really a fabrication it's not that people have made it up so much as they've not developed it seriously all the way through to say okay we've got a million pieces of rna in this test tube how is it going to invent metabolism and we don't have an answer to that well I, th I think this is the least problem that school has uh, to have <laughs> one wrong subject about that because all the others, the exams, the teacher, the structure is so wrong that it's the last problem that the school but has. But it's kind of symptomatic though as well, which is to say it's taught as if it's a fact. It's taught as if this is part of the curriculum. I don't think it is part of the yeah. curriculum, but, but you know, but, stuff which uh, is not a fact is a myth is taught as if it's a fact. Everything. That's the Everything actually in school is taught as a fact, which kind of, there is no fact. Uh, all science is 
is evolving, it's changing. Yeah, I mean, there are things which are more true than others, let's say. Fact <laughs> is a difficult word. I, I mean, I'm not <laughs> postmodern in the sense that I do think stuff is real. I do think there are things which you can ascertain. We can call it a fact because there's enough serious consensus about it. But then there's a, a kind of a tendency to usurp other bits of information and describe them as facts when they're not, when they're very insecure, and to pretend that we have a, a sound structure, a sound basis for the things that we say. And you know, one of the things I've learned over you know a couple of decades of being in universities and working on working on let's say the cutting edge of some idea is is that what we think we know is often very shaky. Uh, actually, we don't really know. And it's not completely wrong, but neither is it completely right. And it's really difficult to to kind of stand up in front of people and say, it's kind of quite subtle, say, well, what we what we know is not really right, <laughs> but it's not completely wrong either. And these bits, we think it's, it's probably okay for these reasons and those bits, well, frankly, I think that's wrong. And then someone else says, well, no, I disagree with you about that. And, and then, you know, people are left thinking, well, hang on, <laughs> who's right? You can't both be right. And, and, you know, COVID was a very good example of, it looks very bad when scientists squabble in public about should, should we have a lockdown or should we not have a lockdown or should we, you know, is, does this treatment work or not work and so on. And, and people argue about it and the public kind of thinks, well, this is it's not very seemly. Why, why are you arguing? Why are you squabbling? And actually, that's how science works. We're always arguing and squabbling about things. And, and eventually, we come to some kind of an agreement. And if, if people are taught that from the beginning and understand that science is a way of trying to, trying to struggle through the stuff we don't know to try and come up with something which is better than what we didn't know before, and that it's also a fun path to follow is kind of an adventure in the wilderness and the intellectual wilderness it's a lot more appealing a lot more fun and then when people argue in public about what it all means that makes sense you now understand that it's it's not it's not that we, we're disagreeing about facts it's interpretation of what we think might be facts but can't be sure even then they are facts so it's a lot more subtle a lot more fun a lot more interesting um uh, than, than than we're ever taught in school I see you are doing uh, some podcast, uh, like often thing that you are doing podcast. So why why are you doing the podcast? Like what is the uh, what is the reason, the motivation behind uh, this uh, that you are interested in this? Um, I like talking. <laughs> yeah. This is this is fun. I'm having a good time here. Um, it's uh, I, I don't know actually. I mean it. It's partly, I, I think the primary thing is it's just fun. Uh, then there's a secondary one, I suppose, which is that um, I, I, I think we do have a problem with how scientists come across to the rest of the world. And if we, if, if, if I and, and, and lots of other people, you know, talk, um, and maybe maybe what comes across to the rest of the world is that I'm a weirdo and 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 <laughs> odd, strange. Should be you know, God, aren't scientists odd? Uh, but but maybe I could just come across as a human being. I don't know. I'm just trying to just trying to say what comes into my head and be be a normal human being. I think I am a normal human being. Um, <laughs> it would be nice if if it broke down boundaries. If it began to say, you know, we're not talking about some elite in a ivory tower talking down at people. It's not like that. That's not the world I live in. Um, but it's the world that people would project me into. And, and it's very unhelpful for the world if scientists are perceived as an elite in an ivory tower. And I would rather break it. I, I would much rather break the system and and, and have everybody educated as well as possible, break down. I don't have much faith in exams as a way of judging what's it, what people are capable of doing. I don't have any faith in you know conventional intelligence tests like IQ tests about is is this person 
what does it rate somehow what they're capable of no i don't think it does at all i think we're, we're all different we all have different capabilities and if we can find a way of of um bringing out the best in people that's what education should do how do you start doing that well then talking doing podcasts whatever it may be just just making people realize maybe there's something for you here you can come and you can do this and you're welcome that's why i do it Well, that stopped you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm thinking about the reasoning that you gave. Uh, and I was thinking that I, you are actually very right because uh, a lot of people think that scientists is something like a magical that is not like uh, there is a, yeah, a line, a boundary between me. It's them. They are, I, I don't know them. They have something special from uh, enlightenment, from when they are doing something that is very holy or something like that. Because the new scientists became the new religion in a way. In, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the world. And like breaking this and also a kid watching you and like, see, oh, it's just a regular human being that goes and makes experiments and trying to answer questions. So like, I agree that there is a stigma uh, that, uh, kind of. And before me, I started talking randomly with these people in the podcast. It's like, I thought the same way. I'm like, I was like, oh, how am I going to talk with this man? How is so, is they are so much cleverer than me. And it's like, that's no. true, but still, <laughs> that doesn't stop me from learning and asking some questions. The, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I have to say, you know, I've known some very smart people who are simultaneously among the most stupid people I ever met. Um, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It, it, <laughs> I don't know what intelligence is, and I don't know what makes someone intelligent or not. But one thing I do know is, is that if you can find in life what you love doing and that you do it as well as you can, and that over time you get better at doing it and, and what you're doing is something you're happy doing, I don't think we can aspire to any more than that. And I don't think it's a very high aspiration. I think if we can help people find their own path to do those things, then we've done some good in the world. And the world will be a better place for it. Um, and, and that's kind of what I think education should be. And, and at the moment, it feels like a them and us system, as you're saying. And and and, and it, I, I think you're right. Scientists are perceived as a priesthood uh, and tell people what to do and look down on them. Um, and I don't see it that way. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to think it's that way. Um, and I, I do think that if we want to solve the world's problems, then scientists have to be part of society and science has to be part of culture. Um, and, and that means we need to, well, interact as if we were human. <laughs> <laughs> The, the way that I end, uh, that we end uh, every podcast is a special way. You are going to die after this podcast or in 5, 10, 20, 100 years. This is the last uh, words that you have uh, to say to, to the, before you die. And we're going ah. to come back. If you actually die in 100 years, 50 years, we're going to come back to this 20, 30, 40 seconds and look back uh, what's your message, what you wanted to say. Oh, God. So, <laughs> that's, that's tough. Uh, so the stage the moment. Is, is yours. <laughs> I'm going to come up with something really stupid, I'm afraid. Um, I, uh, I was just going to say, just, just do it. Just go and do it. Uh, what do, I, I mean, I, be, believe that you're capable of things. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the, what I would want other people to hear. Um, believe you can do it and do it and do good. Um, do what you think is the right thing to do. But listen and think and use your own brain and exercise your own judgment and try and cultivate that judgment and um, try and lead life physically and mentally to the full. We can all do that, and we're all going to be better for it, and the world will be better for it, and we can we can inspire those around us. And what I want to do with my life is that. So when it comes to dying, that's what I hope I will have done. That's what I would like to do, and that's what I hope 
other people will I would like to say I would like to inspire them to do those things. Uh, it doesn't seem like a big ask, but uh, it can be hard. And that's what I would like to do. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching. We love you. Thank you for your mm. time. <laughs>